Spoiler alert. The following will contain spoilers for Loki. What's going on, everybody? It's me, E-Man, from E-Man's Movie Reviews. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we are finally here at the final episode of Loki. And boy, oh boy, did we have some things to talk about today. Oh my goodness, look. Now, as some of you would expect, this episode was going to have a lot of exposition. It had to, right? Because there's so much stuff that it has to set up for the future of the MCU. And as you can tell, this is clearly a long video, so without further ado, let's jump right into it. We zoom out of the planet into a view of the main MCU timeline. Loki and Sylvie approach the mysterious Citadel. The doors open and the two variants walk in. As they are about to explore the place, a scary-faced Miss Minutes pops up out of nowhere. She tells them that he who remains is impressed by their journey and that he's offered them a deal. That deal being that both Loki and Sylvie can be in the same timeline and they both can rule. Loki could defeat the Avengers, kill Thanos, and have all the Infinity Stones and even rule Asgard too. Sylvie can have a lifetime of happy memories. Both of the variants decline the offer and Miss Minutes disappears. In that opening sequence, I thought it was actually pretty cool to get that collection of voices from the MCU um, because they did kind of overlap one another. And this could be just a fun way towards the multiverse, whether it's blending or colliding or just becoming a whole mess in general. And something else to pay attention to is the fact that the timeline, if you notice, was in a circular fashion. One of those reasons could be that the end of time is actually the beginning, and the beginning is at the end. It is true that there are philosophers who you can hear in the opening sequence who talk about how time is an illusion and how it could appear like a flat circle if we started viewing it from the fourth dimension. Now, I'm not going to get super deep with that, and I'll try and keep it much more simple, and I'll explain this circular representation of the timeline a little bit later on in this video. I believe that it does have some roots in the comics, and all I want you to remember right now is just that it is in a big loop. Now, Sylvie made a very curious statement when she said that she was pruned before Loki ever existed, and I saw some comments online by some people being a little bit confused by that. Basically, she's talking about when they became variants, not necessarily their actual ages. She was pruned first before this Loki variant was created. Just remember that variants are created or born the moment they branch from the main timeline. Now, as for creepy face Miss Minutes, I told y'all this chick cannot be trusted. I'm not gonna lie. She got me with that little jump scare though. I mean, look at those eyes. They are the thing of nightmares. But we see here in this scene, she's offering up some tantalizing deals for both Loki and Sylvie. The offer was interesting, because it supposedly was something that each one of the variants have pursued their whole lives, but now their motivations have changed. Both variants are different people than they were predestined to be previously. Keep in mind that this offer came from He Who Remains, and the reason why it's important is because it's all just a test. We'll talk about why later on, but for now, the point of this offer is just to see if they will revert to their old selves or if they truly have outgrown that quote-unquote Loki script that all the other Lokis have fallen victim to. Remember, the fact that Loki and Sylvie don't follow this script anymore is exactly what makes them special from the other variants of Loki. One other thing to consider, there's some biblical symbology going on here that I know a lot of people have already taken notice to. I mean, we've got like an Adam and Eve type of thing going on where Loki is Adam and Sylvie is Eve. Both who, by the way, are presented with temptation by the serpent, Miss Minutes. And then, of course, we have the godlike figure in He Who Remains, where he was already referenced as being the one that created and controls all. Now, this allegory is something that continues throughout the entire episode, so of course, keep this in mind. Back at the TVA, Ravona is downloading some files to her temp pad. She realizes that these were not the files that she requested, but Miss Minutes said that he thought these files would be more helpful. Okay, a couple of things we can look at in this scene. Did you notice how Renslayer was looking at the rings on the table left by Mobius? 
I believe this just shows us that she actually genuinely cared about Mobius as a friend. So maybe she's not completely dirty. But we gotta talk about Miss Minutes. I mean, we know that she's been acting like the Alexa for the TVA, but secretly, she's really been getting down like the Skynet because she's been working for He Who Remains. This just shows that not only is she capable of lying, but talking about the Void spaceship, she was able to conceal information too. I mean, you see them shifty eyes, right? You can't trust her TikTok looking face. As for the information Ravona requested, in the last episode, she asked for all the information on the founding of the TVA from the beginning of time. She was concerned about whoever it was that created the TVA, and I think she wanted to protect them. However, Miss Minutes gave her information that was different than what she requested. Now, we don't know exactly what that information is yet, but we'll come back to that later. In the Citadel, Loki and Sylvie approach an elevator, and as the doors open, He Who Remains appears. He invites them to come talk in his office. Sylvie tries to take a couple of swings at him, but he evades all of her strikes. As a good host, he pours the variants a couple cups of espresso. Well, 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 is that, uh, is that Jonathan Majors I see there? Hmm, uh, Kang variant? Ha ha ha, hmm, hmm. Color me shocked. Now, of course, if you've been following my breakdowns, you already know that this has been one of my top theories as just one of the many possibilities of who could be behind it all. Now, I will admit, I didn't get this completely right. While I did say that a Kang variant might appear, I thought it would have been a Mortis from the comics. However, Marvel pulled a fast one on us. They didn't make this character a Mortis, he's actually he who remains. Plus, the Loki director has been interviewed about this very question, and she said, Kang is the variant, but he's also not technically Immortus. It's a bit like Sylvie, right? She's a unique character in relation to our story. He Who Remains is in the comics, but the version in our show was very different. He's closer to Immortus, but he's a unique character for our story. But Kang is a variant of that character. To be more accurate, they made He Who Remains into a Kang variant. The MCU is changing this character up because in the comics, He Who Remains was not a Kang variant at all. Anyway, you guys already know, I was overjoyed when I saw uh, Jonathan Majors pop up out of that elevator. First of all, I was like, whoo! <laughs> you know, because that would have been something if it was like King Loki or Supreme Loki or whatever, uh, the Supreme Mobius, I don't know, whatever the thoughts were out there. Um, but you already know, I was kicking and screaming at 2 o'clock in the morning. I was just super, super happy about this. Not because I was happy um, about predicting it, but mostly because all this prediction stuff is just fun, right? Like, I don't care if I'm right or wrong about these things. What I do care about, especially with Jonathan Majors, is that you guys are all in for a treat. This brother right here can act his tail off. If you're new to Jonathan Majors, go watch The Last Black Man in San Francisco. If the story isn't for you, then just watch it for his acting ability. You can also get a taste of what he can do in The Five Bloods on Netflix, and of course, you can definitely check him out in Lovecraft Country on HBO. You know, that one season of Lovecraft Country. And you could definitely go check out my Lovecraft Country videos as well, but definitely go look this man up and you'll see why Marvel does a really good job with finding talent and casting people, you know, when they really want to. Meanwhile, Mobius says, guess who's Bazak? And drops in on Renslayer. She calls in for backup, but they aren't responding. We jump to Ohio 2018, and Hunter B-15 is being pursued by other TVA agents. As they approach her, they find out that Renslayer is the principal of this high school. She lets them know that they have a lot to talk about in regards to the truth behind the TVA. Back in Renslayer's office, she tells Mobius about the necessity of the TVA to maintain order. He brings up their friendship and just how bogus it was for her to just prune him like that. He felt like she betrayed him, and Renslayer was like, hold up, wait a minute, because it was Mobius that betrayed her after eons of friendship. 
She opens up a time door and Mobius gets the prune stick out to stop her. She says, silly man, your weapons cannot harm me and proceeds to drop him. Rather than pruning him, she ends up just leaving through the time door. Now, as I mentioned in my previous breakdowns, I talked about how uh, Renslayer might be prepping all the other TVA agents uh, against, you know, like an insurrection or revolt by basically telling them that Mobius and Hunter B-15 were all crazy. However, by going back to the point in time where we discover Renslayer's past, this is all the proof that's needed to convince any doubting hunters that the TVA is full of variants. This also lets us know that the pen from the previous episodes was actually a relic from Renslayer's past and not one from the favorite analyst Mobius mentioned. So that was a fun little twist. But during this scene, I think we learned a little bit more about where Renslayer's priorities actually lie. Her faith in the person who created the TVA and the TVA is rooted in the desire of preserving order. On top of that, she's thinking of the bigger picture, so much so that she's even ready to give up the notion of free will and believes that only the one in charge should have that free will. Now, this can be a very important trait to remember about Ravona. She's willing to do whatever it takes to maintain order. And I think that means that she could easily be attracted to whoever will provide that power and control to maintain that order. Now, I found it interesting that while she may concede that the TVA is a lie, she's still pushing back by suggesting maybe it's a necessary lie. Now, I can't help but to think about how this can actually apply to various beliefs some people may have, whether they're spiritual, they're religious, or have no belief at all. Now, I'm not judging any side of the spectrum, but the philosophical question to consider is whether or not that belief or lack thereof serves a greater benefit for the individual or group at large. So for Renslayer, she's challenging the notion of the TVA being a lie because the order and stability it provides to the timeline in her view is a greater benefit compared to the potential chaos or madness that could ensue when people learn the truth. Think of it like this. Let's say you have a religion that has a moral code and it helps people act accordingly. However, people find out that this religion was all a lie. Some people may still act moral because you don't really need a religion to be a moral person, while some other people may actually say, forget this, time to wild out, there are no rules, it's purge time. So even if that religion was a lie in this example, at the very least, it was preventing a bunch of potential purge events from happening. Anyway, I hope that example maybe made a little bit of sense to help you think about the mindset and perspective of Renslayer in this situation. Now, for you comic fans, you already know that Ravona has a lot of ties in the comics to Kang the Conqueror. Given how the TVA is already on the verge of being like a religious cult, and Ravona is a devout follower, I think we're seeing the beginnings of how she will eventually fall for Kang the Conqueror or one of his variants in the future. But wait a minute, damn Mobius, all this time, all these eons in the TVA, and you still don't know how to fight? I mean, you can't throw them paws? Nothing? But anyway, a big question many people have is where did Renslayer end up going? Well, the only real clue that we have is her very last line where she says she's going in search of free will. Recall what she alluded to earlier when she said that the only person who should have free will is the one in charge. Plus, we also know that it was he who remains that sent her different files to her temp pad. So while we may not know where she's going, we do know that she's going in search of who's in charge. I do have a theory on exactly where she went, but I'll have to save that for another future theory video. But I am curious, what do you think about Renslayer and what she's about to do? Let me know in the comments. At the Citadel, Loki and Sylvie speak to He Who Remains. While Loki believes that they have won by finding him, he merely giggles at that notion. Sylvie is still feeling feisty and takes another swipe at him, but he evades that just as easily too. 
He pulls out a transcript of their meeting, which shows that all of their words and actions have already been written. He admits that he knew about every moment and every conversation, including the ones that the TVA were unaware of. Sylvie rebuts and says that they broke the game and that this is how they were able to make it to the Citadel. But he who remained said, Wrong. Wrong. <laughs> He informed them that every single step was paved by him and the variants just walked down the path. Okay, let's back up real quick. Did you guys notice the statues in the Citadel? One of them was knocked over. I wonder what kind of fight broke out to make that happen. Maybe the variants were all fighting at this point. I don't know. Let me know what you think might have caused that to happen. Okay, but there is a lot to dissect here in this scene and I'm going to have to put on my philosophy hat. Um, so hold on to your butts uh i feel like this is a similar version of like the architect scene back in the matrix movie so i'm gonna break this up a little bit throughout this whole conversation so that we can cover the more important details the first thing we have to understand is according to he who remains he's been scripting everything he's been paving a path for the variants to walk down all this time now, I'm going to tell you this right now, and this is going to have to be a mental key to unlock many of the questions that you might have when it comes to this series in total. Now, you might not like this, but to answer a lot of questions that are going to arise here, you're going to have to go into the mode of thinking, which is very similar to when people say, well, God did it. As he who remains puts it, he carved the path for everything to happen. So while Sylvie and Loki thought that they were acting on their own free will, to a certain extent they were, but not really. This is what you call in philosophy compatibilism. Compatibilism is the belief that free will and determinism are mutually compatible and that it is possible to believe in both without being logically inconsistent. So while he who remains might have been paving the path, the participants still have to make the conscious free will choice to walk down it. Their options might be limited, but the choice is still there for them to some degree. And before you go saying, no E-Man, there is no free will with him running the show, that's not actually true. There is free will, it's just that if and when you try to exercise it, and if it goes against the subjective desires of he who remains, then you get pruned, sent to limbo, and devoured by Eliath. Kid Loki said this in the previous episode where he mentioned every time one of the Lokis tries to fix themselves, they get sent to that place. So free will does exist, it just gets punished via pruning and more. Another thing we have to pay attention to is this interesting set of things said by he who remains. When Sylvie asked why are they there if he knows what's going to happen, he says that you can't get to the end until you're changed by the journey. This stuff needs to happen to get all of us in the right mindset. That right there is so important because it's an indication that if things don't play out right or if they don't play out a certain way, then the characters and motivations and future actions of Loki and Sylvie won't happen or won't play out a certain way. So we saw this in full display uh, back during Infinity War and Endgame. Remember Doctor Strange saw all those possible events and outcomes and when he pretty much saw what was going to happen during Endgame, he let all those events happen because if he hadn't, then Tony Stark would have never been changed by the journey to get into the right mindset to sacrifice himself to save the world. See how that works? So he who remains has been doing something very similar with Loki and Sylvie too. He's been shaping them and molding them through their journey to get to him. We all know that they indeed have been changed by this journey and they do have a different mindset because they both turned down the test from Miss Minutes earlier on. So what does this actually mean for Loki and Sylvie now? I think it means that there's still yet a bigger role for them to play and that every single step that they take now will affect their future actions and who they become down the road. He who remains acknowledges that his methods are a bit immoral, but he tells Sylvie and Loki that his mission was true. That mission was to build up the TVA, 
to prevent another future version of himself from trying to take over the multiverse. He recounts the story of how a variant of himself from the 31st century on Earth discovered the multiverse and interacted with his other variants who made the same discovery. While there was peace and an exchange of knowledge and technology, there were other variants out there that wanted to conquer other new worlds instead. A multiversal war broke out that almost destroyed everything. However, unlike what the TVA propaganda stated, the real story is that He Who Remains found Eliath and harnessed its power to end the multiversal war. Afterwards, he isolated the timeline and prevented any branches from forming. He finally created the TVA to maintain his work and keep everyone safe. So, you know, kiss the ring. Okay, now we got to take another break and dissect all of that. Now, I'm glad he admitted that his actions here were morally problematic because they were. Let's not lose sight that every single time he destroys a branch reality, he's killing tons of people. However, in true Marvel fashion, they like to make these characters have a bit of gray in their character. Remember what Loki said about everyone good is not really good and everyone bad is not really bad. He who remains himself said that while it is a problem that he's stopping those branches from growing, he's serving a bigger purpose of protecting the multiverse from his other variants. These other variants being intent on conquering other worlds and universes. As he said, without the TVA in his work, everything burns. This basically makes the TVA a necessary evil. Right now, there isn't a clear option that they can use to keep away the multiverse war that they obviously are not prepared for. Now in this scene, we do get a little bit of clarity and some of the truth too, right? So in my past breakdowns, I've been telling you whenever the TVA tells you something, you just wanna take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. Clearly that was a straight up propaganda lie for the employees to drink the Kool-Aid. Now the real question here is like, how did he end up stopping this multiversal war? Did he have Eliath destroy all the other multiverses? Or maybe did he just scare them straight and they're just staying in their lane? I also thought it was pretty funny when he who remains was talking about the multiverse war and ended up just saying like, you're welcome. This is just yet another constant pattern in Marvel where everyone, including the villains, believe that they are the heroes in their own story. As eccentric as he may be, he who remains definitely believes that he's been doing the greater good by creating the TVA and preventing another multiverse war. And then, of course, he also mentioned that if you think he's evil, then his other variants are going to be far worse. So what do you think? Do you think he's a hero or a villain? He Who Remains tells them that if they get rid of him, a far worse threat will come about. He's lived a million lifetimes and believes that the TVA is the only way to keep the multiverse safe. However, he gives Loki and Sylvie two options. One, being that they kill him, but have to deal with an infinite amount of other more evil variants of himself. Or two, both Loki and Sylvie would run the TVA, thereby continuing the work that he started. He said that he's grown old and tired. He knows that Loki and Sylvie are the best candidates to run the TVA. At that moment, he who remains acknowledges that they have just crossed the threshold and now branches in the timeline have begun forming. Sylvie is in disbelief and Loki stops her right before she tries to kill he who remains. Well, this certainly really was a gambit for them to consider. I mean, you either run the TVA or you let a whole multiverse war happen. What I found interesting here is when He Who Remains actually gave them a slightly different option with running the TVA and mentioned that they could actually tell everyone the truth. Now that does sound a little bit more reasonable in the fact that Sylvie and Loki would at least be able to do things slightly different. It still sucks that they'd be killing a bunch of people every time they prune them, but at least there would be a little bit more transparency and the bigger picture would make more sense for the agents. Not to mention, they'd at least have a higher level of free will to either work for the TVA or not. All right, now I have to admit, Sylvia's starting to get a little annoying to me here. I mean, don't get me wrong. I totally understand her hesitancy uh, here because this is personal for her, right? I mean, and she's right. He Who Remains is definitely bogus for killing all those branch realities. However, when you hear about the other possibility of an even bigger threat, 
at the very least, I don't think it's too much to ask to simply say, hey, stop. Think about it just for a second. As he who remains said, it's not personal, but practical. And this is a difficult thing for people to grapple with. I mean, Sylvie is so untrusting because of all the many, many years of being on the run and all the losses that she's suffered that she's ignoring logic at this point. Look, let me tell you something. He who remains straight up told her, grow up. (laughs) And I thought that was pretty funny. He was like, grow up. Because seriously, she's caught up in all these emotions right now and allowing them to dictate her actions. And there's nothing wrong with feeling emotions, but they're not always the best barometer for making decisions. We also learned here that there was a threshold or a certain point where he who remains said that the branches would begin and everything else from that point was uncertain. Now, I'll definitely explain that a little bit more in this video, but what I found interesting at this point is the look of relief on his face when this happened. For the first time in a long time, he simply did not know what was going to happen next. I mean, imagine being used to knowing everything for millions of lifetimes, and then all of a sudden, everything is about to be new for you. Also, when he said that he's much older than he looks, I think that is yet again another clue for us to identify him as he who remains and not a Mortis or some other Kang variant. That's just a subtle way for Marvel to connect this character with the old decrepit version from the comics. Now, of course, we're not about to just gloss over the fact that this man just said that he was about to be reincarnated. He said that even if they kill him, he'll end up right back here anyway. Now, this could mean a couple things. Maybe he meant a version of him will be back, or maybe he was being literal in terms of he is destined to return anyway. Remember when we saw the timeline outside the Citadel and in his demonstration, it's represented as a full circle? If we look to the comics, he who remains was the very last being at the end of time and the last director of the TVA. This guy decided to go back in time, create the TVA and the timekeepers. This was done all to ensure that the TVA is created and the timeline in which they're created is preserved. So in a way, It's a bit of a time paradox that's going on here because a being from the end of time went into the past to create the very organization that exists in the future. It's because of this loop or paradox that I believe we see the timeline shaped in a circular form. This also could explain why he talks about being reincarnated and living millions of lifetimes because that's what would happen if you existed in a constant time loop. But hey, that's just my interpretation on it. I don't know if that's actually the case because time travel's fiction and Marvel can literally make up whatever they want. But for me, this kind of helps me make sense of what's going on and hopefully it makes sense for you too. Loki and Sylvie fight one another about whether they should kill he who remains or not. Loki says that he believes the story about the multiversal war, and Sylvie thinks that Loki simply wants the throne. He begs for her to see the bigger picture with the potential risk of the outcome. She ain't trying to hear none of that. The two get into a sword fight, and Loki surrenders, asking her to stop. He tells her that he understands what she's feeling, and that he only wants her to be okay. The two share in a passionately awkward kiss. She pushes him through the time door while using the temp pad of He Who Remains. She shanks him in his chair, and he tells her that he'll see her soon. Outside the Citadel, millions of branches and timelines begin to grow out of control. At the TVA, Mobius and B-15 look on at the monitors as the charts continue to grow. A saddened Loki rushes off to find Mobius, And as he recounts what is happening and what will happen, Mobius doesn't seem to recognize Loki. As he looks on, he sees a statue of he who remains. Damn it, Sylvie! But before we get to her, let's cover a previous point I brought up. Recall that point of where they crossed the threshold and he who remains didn't know what was going to happen next? I think this was a very similar concept that was introduced back in Doctor Strange. Remember, the Ancient One understood time travel and all, but she was unable to see beyond her own death. This could be a similar situation with He Who Remains. The only thing he does know for sure is that he will be reincarnated because he's probably ensured that the TVA gets recreated over and over again. 
but he might not know the future of the multiverse because this version of him would eventually be killed. Okay, now back to Sylvie. Damn it, Sylvie! You mean after all this time you still think Loki is about to betray you? I think this is one of those moments in the writing that might have pushed Sylvie's character a little too far in the amount of distrust that she's exhibiting. At this point, it feels like she's only distrusting just for the sake of the plot and not so much because that's what her character demands. Despite everything, she's convinced that Loki wants the throne. I mean, they were literally offered all of this just moments ago with Miss Minutes and Loki, right in front of her, declined all of that. But none of that was enough for her. Now, don't get me wrong. I do understand why it's hard for her to trust people, but I'm just saying from a creative standpoint, I feel like they should have given a little bit more effort to help the audience see more reasons as to why she's so uh, distrusting of people. For example, earlier we saw He Who Remains plant some seeds by asking her if she could really trust someone like Loki. I think this episode would have benefited a little bit more from seeing more of things like that because up until this entire point of the show, Loki has not given her any real reason to all of a sudden just stop trusting him. I mean, this man was about to sacrifice his life in front of Eliath for you. He gave you a weirdo selfie kiss. He even made you a magical blanket. A magical blanket! Fun little thing to notice here, Sylvie just displayed another magic trick because during the fight, she made Loki just disappear. Did she just make that man teleport or something? I don't appreciate Marvel just throwing these things out there like we not gonna ask these questions. I thought all she could do was enchant people since no one taught her magic, but now she's making people disappear and Loki just reappeared out of nowhere. Anyway, the only thing we could take away from that for now is that maybe this will be a trick we'll see Loki use even more in the future. But let's get back to Sylvie and her big decision. Damn it, Sylvie! You just screwed the entire MCU universe! Man, I tell you, Star-Lord is out there somewhere taking a huge sigh of relief that people will finally get off his case for what happened in Infinity War. Now, in this scene, we can go back to the biblical analogy I mentioned earlier with the whole Adam and Eve comparison. Killing he who remains is just like taking a bite out of that apple and opening Pandora's box all over the multiverse. Sad to say it, but folks are going to blame every single problem for the next 10 years of the MCU all on Sylvie. All because she couldn't grow up. But I'm not going to put this all on Sylvie. Some of that blame needs to go on he who remains too. Remember, if he was paving the way for them all this time, why didn't he make her experience less traumatic? Remember, it's all about the journey, right? When we saw the very little Sylvie earlier on, we saw what seemed like aspirations of her maybe becoming a hero. But he who remained paved the path for her that erased much of that, and now she's filled with rage, contempt, and seeking out revenge. So this is definitely on him, too. With all his knowledge, he could have done for her what he did for Loki. Loki is a completely different character now. He used to have aspirations for the throne and all that glorious purpose. But now Loki is able to focus his motivations and ambitions elsewhere. I mean, he got to the point where he was falling for Sylvie and even made himself a friend in Mobius. Even after being offered all the things he used to desire, he turned away from them. Sylvie, on the other hand, has grown a little bit more one-dimensional in her focus, seeking out vengeance after enduring a life of pain and suffering while being on the run. That's why she said to Loki, I'm not you. But this is also why we see her in this position after killing He Who Remains. Notice that she got what she thought she wanted in his death, but in actuality, she got very little at all. And this is kind of like one of the reasons why people talk about the power of forgiveness. Because forgiveness isn't just some free pass to the perpetrator of wrongdoing. I mean, to an extent it is. However, forgiveness is really for yourself so that you're not a prisoner of your own bitterness. Sylvie, in this case, is left with this empty feeling, a, 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 a void almost. Because even though she killed he who remains... There's nothing for her to fill in that void of all that pain that she's been feeling for so long. Her family is still gone. All the memories she had, they're still just distant memories. 
Only thing she gets now is probably even more regret and sorrow once she sees the madness that she's just unleashed upon the multiverse. And about that, well, we're in the multiverse now. We got a couple things we got to clear up. Now, to be clear, the multiverse always existed. Doctor Strange confirmed that, and so did He Who Remains. And like I said before, we don't know what actually happened to those other universes or what He Who Remains did to them. We also don't know how far reaching the impact of Sylvie's actions will go or who's affected by it or not. So until we have clear answers, I think the best explanation so far is that Loki went through the time door and went to a different timeline or reality. Remember, the timelines were already diverging and branching out before he left and before He Who Remains died. So when he went through that time door, he may have fallen into an alternate timeline that is dominated by a variant of He Who Remains. That would explain why things are different, even in the TVA, and why Loki still remembers things. And by the way, I just wanted to point out that Marvel just increased the number of universes and timelines within the MCU. Meaning that Marvel has a wide open playbook that they can do almost anything with that they desire. That includes telling new stories, retelling old stories with a twist, or even recasting characters. The amount of possibilities are endless, which is yet another reason why I try to point out to people that Marvel does not hard reboot things and start all over. At most, they do soft reboots, which this kind of is. While all the other stuff may be a little different, the fact that you still have Loki and maybe some other characters remembering how things used to be, this is the very reason why Marvel still keeps going and like I said, they don't reboot. But from an audience perspective, I've already told you that I think the multiverse always existed And now a lot of the previous Marvel TV shows are going to become canon. Because like it or not, a lot of shows that were like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or the Marvel shows, they never really counted as MCU canon. And that was for a lot of different business reasons. You can refer to one of my past live recap videos where I actually go into more detail about that. However, now that we have this multiverse of madness, all these other universes may start to combine or collide or something. As of right now, we don't know what the rules are for the multiverse in the MCU. Matter of fact, just recently, Kevin Feige has admitted that Marvel Studios just had a meeting to understand the rules of how the multiverse works. To me, that means that there are going to be a lot of important things that we're going to have to understand about the multiverse over time. And we're going to have to wait for Marvel to teach us those rules as well. So whatever you do, don't go counting on all these other YouTube channels telling you that this is for certain or this is the way the multiverse works because nobody actually knows yet. Heck, even everything I'm telling you at this point is just the best educated guess. So just be flexible just in case Marvel decides to throw some more curveballs down the line. Okay, but last but not least, of course, we have to talk about that amazing shot of the uh, statue at the end of the episode. Now, you and I both know that Kang the Conqueror will eventually come to Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. I'm going to warn you all right now to be very careful. This statue may or may not actually be Kang the Conqueror. When I was listening to the audio description on Disney+, Plus, they referred to the statue as being a statue of He Who Remains. So again... What I've been trying to emphasize to you guys is that when Marvel says this is that character, don't go trying to make it something that you think it's supposed to be. So that statue, maybe it's Kang, but they haven't said that it's Kang because it could just be a whole nother variant of He Who Remains. And all I'm saying is that we know how Marvel gets down when they try to pull a fast one on people. Do not get your expectations up that this is Kang until we get more confirmation. Don't let other YouTube channels send you off and get your expectations up. But this is just like I've said before. We can speculate with no weight. I just don't want to hear nobody complaining in the future if Marvel turns around and says, oh, that's not actually Kang. That's Immortus. Or no, that's not even Immortus. That's actually Nathaniel Richards. Or that's some other variant of He Who Remains. 
Don't get your hopes up because your own disappointment is going to be on you and not on Marvel. So again, hold off on all those predictions until we get that confirmation. Wait up. Hold on. Wait a minute. Where is Mobius and his jet ski? Anyway, that's it. We finally come to the end of the road with Loki. How did you feel about that Jonathan Majors reveal? How did you feel about this final episode in regards to the entire series? Uh, Where does Loki rank for you in the current MCU TV shows with WandaVision and Falcon and the Winter Soldier? I mean, what other big questions do you have that are still left unanswered from this show? We got confirmation that there will be a season two for Loki, so that is definitely good news. However, we have no idea when that's actually going to happen. Maybe that happens after Doctor Strange 2. Uh, Maybe it happens before Ant-Man and the Wasp. Maybe it happens after. All I know is... I'll be here to chat with you guys either way. So let me just tell you all, thank you all so, so much for taking the time to join me on this magical journey with Loki. It's been such a joy to be able to do these breakdowns for you all and really just have a whole lot of fun with this. As you know, in just a few weeks, Marvel's What If series will be coming out soon. I want to say it's around August 11th, um, and I believe it's going to be like 10 episodes or so. As you already know, we're going to be joining up live every wednesday when the what if series comes out that's going to be happening at 5 p.m pacific time and uh, 8 p.m eastern time so please don't miss it i'm trying to tell you it is so much fun as for what you can expect from me coming up you know i can't reveal too much because i got certain folks that are ready to steal my theories so i'll just say that i've got a major theory Uh, that lets you know what He Who Remain fixes a major Marvel plot hole that has never been resolved. Also, I might have a fun theory for you all, and I'll just say it's got to do with the devious Miss Minutes. I can't say more than that, but just know I'll be working on that as soon as possible for you all. So in the meantime, you already know it. I've got more videos and reviews to do for you all. And until next time, I'll see you all later.